Great. Thanks for coming, everyone. This is such an exciting group of people. We have an amazing group of panelists here today. Um, so this is a session on modern day portfolio management. I'm Jessica Giantonio. I run the East Coast team of account managers here at DCS. Um, so as part of my job, I work with clients like all of you every day to solve challenges around how you're going to adopt new technology, work with big data, and really um, improve efficiencies across your organization. So this is very exciting for me personally, and assuming from the turnout here, it's exciting for all of you as well. Um, we do want this to be really collaborative, uh, so please feel free to interrupt at any time to ask questions. Uh, the team here is very excited to hear your thoughts as well. So we have Josiah positioned in the back who has a mic. So just flag him down if you, uh, if you have some questions. Um, so we'll go ahead and get started and then I'm going to take a minute to introduce themselves. Do I have to turn this on or? <laughs> <laughs> Um, I'm Christy Huberger. I work for LaSalle Investment Management. Um, I head up our, our leader U.S. Um, asset management platform. Um, we have, I would say, it's about 270 some odd uh, portfolios of buildings or assets um, and over 100 and some square foot of space. Um, so take a look at it in the, the U.S., uh, you know, Having a way to kind of look at a lot of that information was very key for us as, as we, we start to um, think about uh, managing our business. Um, I'm out of our Chicago office. I also am part of our America's board um, and just started uh, championing our data and technology committee, uh, really trying to push um, on our board as well as this now new committee that we've started um, in the Americas of the business side, really focusing on technology and how it's changing our business, how can it change what we do, um, and not just, you know, it's not just something your CIO owns, right? We all own it ourselves. So. I think I, hey, it's turned on. <laughs> Michael Kirby, I'm with Vesco Real Estate. I'm responsible for our uh, operations here in North America for IRE and, uh, and for U.S. asset management, and uh, as a result, uh, all things sort of technology uh, fall in my purview here in the U.S., and I tie together with the team uh, globally to help manage our uh, technology and applications around the globe. I'm Alan Rubenstein with New York Life, I'm East uh, Region Head of Asset Management, and um, we're sort of in the platform building stage for that. Uh, I've done a realignment of our asset management function nationally, and technology uh, is becoming a big focus of ours. I'm actually an early adopter of VTS, um, a three-time uh, client as well. So, um, all different stages. We started when the really neat thing was there was a camera walking through a, a building, and we could show people and, and kind of track their interests. So, um, glad to be here. Thank you. So I think to start with, um, just better understanding how you're all leveraging technology today, uh, kind of give us a baseline of what you're currently using, um, and then we can kind of talk to, uh, to the future of that as well. Great. Actually, it's, um, I would say we're using about 20% uh, of where I want to be um, and where it would be great to, to have things, but I'm excited to where we're at. Um, having been in the industry for quite some time, um, you know, it's exciting to see um, new technology come to real estate. I mean, we've always had the core base systems, um, put a lot in, it's a black hole, you can't ever get it out, you can't see it. Um, you know, it's all focused around the accounting system, uh, you know, and the functions. Um, now to actually use uh, different things to manage business. I think the industry also is changing for folks that, um, Prior to coming to LaSalle, which I came to two years ago, I worked for GE Real Estate, um, and we were big enough to have you know the people and the dollars to build systems and, and do things. Um, those quickly got antiquated as well, and um, you know so the the current environment that has a lot of these web-based new technology constantly changing allows everybody access to that kind of stuff and allows us to keep current uh, with those. Um, one of the things and kind of how we're leveraging today, I was thinking about how, you know, I was leveraging 
um, what we were doing for those same things 10 years ago. I remember thinking it was kind of, um, it was innovative at one point in time that we got our operations team to put together this monthly report on a lot of uh, conversion ratios and lease activities and all of this kind of stuff. And it was great because a lot of the leaders were asking those questions or needed to know as we were trying to drive a portfolio. And um, this was a way to push the information, right? So everybody had it and so on and, and for that. Uh, but it was on a month lag. It was only really the leaders that were getting the information and the individual asset managers were getting to leverage that same information releasing folks who had internal leasing uh, to do that. Today, that's a whole different story, right? So real time, I can look at all that same stuff I did 10 years ago. Now I can look at it anytime I want, pull it up on my iPad, um, my computer, <clears throat> look at what those are, see what trends are, and I can do it when I'm thinking about it um, versus, okay, the report comes out here and when I get a chance to review it and so on, I have a question about it or I've got time or I'm focusing on it uh, and I can get that. So, I think for us and some of the things that um, we are doing to leverage technology right now, BTS and the front end engine, all about the revenue, was one of the first big steps that we were taking kind of in the new technology. Um, we're also trying to better leverage some of our older technology, whether it be Argus, uh, you know, AE, um, you know, people are dumping information into there and then pulling it out and putting it in Excel to do stuff to it. I'm like, AE does that, you don't need to do that. So. Um, we're also trying to, you know, leverage some of the technologies we are already involved in, um, and then we're doing a lot of looking at what what are some of the right tools, what questions we get asked. So those are the kind of things of where do we put that in place. But I would say we are at early stages of adopting or, or getting to the technology where we want it to be. Well, I'll jump in and, and uh, uh, agree with. You know everything Chris, Christy said. You know just the, the real time sort of dynamic uh, nature of, of the data and the tools that, that are now available is what's exciting. And you know honestly, we're at different levels of uh, implementation and, and adoption and sort of various platforms. Um, but but it, to me, it's all about the data and it's all about that sort of real time access. I'm gonna I'm gonna ask you to name names. So you know as I, I thought about this question. Uh, just uh, you know, some some things that we're actually doing, uh, you know, at this point in time. Retail, by the way, I think retail's ahead of uh, you know other sectors in the industry to to a great degree in, in uh, technology adoption. But uh, you know, we use tools. Uh, uh, a company called Buxton Company has a, a tool called Scout. Uh, Esri has a, a similar tool. You can do uh, on the fly, real time, really robust uh, <coughs> trade area analysis, demographics, psychographics. I mean, it's it's pretty cool, and uh, uh, you know, getting people to adopt it is sometimes a challenge. But uh, the analysis and the ability to really understand your retail uh, assets is is incredible. Uh, multifamily, I can pull up on my phone here. Uh, Axiometrics, Axiometrics, uh, you know, app uh, is unbelievable. Every freaking apartment property in, in the country is heat mapped, and you can you can look at. Uh, uh, not just you know macro information. You can drill into each one of them, and you can look at today's price by floor plan. It's un unbelievable how robust it is. Um, you know we manage our debt on on a Chatham's debt management platform. We uh, you know AE we've made the shift from DCF. I'm not a I'm not a user, but the the uh, capabilities of AE are tremendous, and we're just beginning to sort of learn that and, and try to leverage those. Um, Honest Buildings is something some of you may be familiar with. Uh, you know, project management at an asset manager level, tremendous tool. Uh, using it in select uh, instances now, thinking about broader implementation. Um, credit, talk about risk management. So tools out there for credit monitoring. Uh, we're using CRM, Credit Risk Monitor. You know, you can you can set up your entire portfolio, monitor your credits, get you know get flags, look at them on a you know, on a, a real time basis. Um, it's, it's not a, you know, private companies are still difficult and challenging, but not impossible. Um, and there are other tools out there. Um, and, and, you know, don't forget, um, don't forget Excel. You know, we've, I've, does anybody know what a power, what a pivot table is? <laughs> I, I, I'm, a, I'm a power user of Lotus 123. 
And, <laughs> but we have some incredibly smart young analysts who can, uh, you know, can take our data, dump it into Excel, and do some incredible stuff that, again, sort of creates these dynamic tools. Um, so I know I'm forgetting some other things. I mean, I could, you know, talk about property level stuff, other enterprise level stuff we're looking at, but those are just a few examples. Oh, yeah. What about the last question? Yeah. yeah. I'll are, are, you, are you taking all of these, uh, these platforms, or these, these technologies, and marrying it together, or are you using... Uh, so that's, that's Nirvana. Uh, <laughs> we're not there yet. Yeah. I mean, we have, you know, we have a proprietary system we started building about four years ago before, you know, uh, before all these other tools really became uh, available and, 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 and robust. Um, and so we're sort of in that stage of, okay, what do we build? What do we buy? Um, you know, we, we, we lean towards buying, thus, you know, uh, VTS, Hightower, uh, et cetera. They're just tremendous platforms that we'll never be able to do ourselves, right? Um, so we're trying to marry that up with sort of our proprietary system. So hopefully we'll get to the point where even if it's a link, you know, it's a one-stop shop to get into these, uh, these different uh, apps. It's an important question on every demo that I, it seems like you know once a week I'm talking to somebody else. But the question of you know it, can you integrate uh, even if it's a you know simple ETL file or whatever. But most of what I found is most of the new call it new technology companies are um, trying you know doing all they can to do that. So you know even if they have to painstakingly do export imports or things like that, help you to get information. Uh, into the tool and to marry marry stuff, um, you know the whole broader BI is a a challenge. And I asked, I, we were at something together, Michael and I. And people were talking about it, especially I brought up. And there's no kind of one solution for it right now. A lot of people are finding out they just kind of data warehouse, data manage, and then have a tool set on top of it uh, to do that. But um, not all of Especially the core systems that have been around for a while, they don't all play nice. So, you know, we still struggle with that as far as getting them interconnected. But one of the biggest challenges of getting adoption is duplication um, of, you know, input of information and things, or where's the world truth setting at? So it's a great, it's something you have to think about in all these. We, we do have a goal, we're not there, of a single point of entry of any piece of data. And so whether it happens in our system and then downloads into to VTS or in whatever, whether it happens out there and then comes back into our system, that's that's sort of an overriding goal. And uh, you know, we're maybe halfway there. The danger of going last. Um, so <laughs> just to add on to what Mike was saying in terms of specific tools, uh, a yield star LRO is great for sort of rent optimization for your multifamily properties. Um, you know, uh, the one thing about all these tools is they are expanding rapidly. They're increasing their mobility capabilities, and um, you know we're going to get into that kind of later. Why that's important from a BI standpoint, um, we've been approaching that and. It's important to use sort of open architecture. Um, you know, so be very selective about what you're choosing to use because they do need to play nicely in the sandbox and and integrate and not interfere with each other. Otherwise, we're we're not interested, basically. And um, so we're using ClickSense to actually combine those uh, those tools that we're using right now. I, I'm, I'm going to jump on this open architecture thing because I was thinking about it with the CEO or you know the C-suite panel, which was fantastic, by the way, uh, and, and maybe it was great. One of the speakers spoke to the open architecture question, and for us, that's you know whatever that really means. I'm not even sure, but it, what from our perspective, and I think, and I, I'm guessing I would speak for for my colleagues here as well. Uh, the platforms that are most valuable to us are those that I can use across my entire portfolio. So anything that is specific to a uh, you know a provider, a property type, but we, you know, that has limited benefit because if I can't deploy it and you look at the data across my portfolio, you know it may be nice, but it, it's not um, you know it's it's not solving a real problem for me.
Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Just protect. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> we can hear you. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, what, uh, what are you guys using right now to kind of aggregate all of your portfolio information, individual assets? So if I'm like, hey, what are your revenue or expenses and all your office assets? Then I want to dissect that by your Texas portfolio and compare that to your Southeast. And what, are you all using anything today in order to aggregate all the information from property managers, from different property managers, or joint venture partners? Well, the idea of this business intelligence tool is that it can take the data out of Yardi, uh, Argus, and uh, you know, various other sources, and then it can slice and dice it uh, so that you can pick a region, a property type, uh, ownership portfolio, and kind of get a breakdown of all the metrics you're looking for. Um, and as, as I mentioned, we're doing that inside of ClickSense uh, with those tools. I'll tell you, but we, as I mentioned, we developed sort of a proprietary, you know, for lack of a better word, data warehouse, but it pulls from all these other platforms. Yardi is our base property management platform that we, you know, insist is deployed across our portfolio. And so a lot of the data comes from there, some of the data comes from Chatham, some of the data comes from, you know, AE, some, you know, wherever it comes from, it gets dumped in there. And uh, in theory, it allows us to uh, slice and dice just, just like you're, you're talking about. I will, I will be totally transparent and say it's not as easy as it should be. And, it, it, and you know, therefore, it, it's, and, you know, we're struggling. I think, you know, if, if we don't talk about data integrity here, you know, we're missing something because you can implement all the cool systems in the world. But if a piece of data is wrong, you know, you know, it's it's dangerous because you know because you have this real time access. You no longer have somebody who's scrubbing it before they present it to you and lay it on your desk. You know, so you know we're spending a lot of time trying to figure that piece out. So there's we're not we're not there yet. The vision is there, but we're not there. Yeah. Yeah. But I found though that the visibility. If you know some of the structure of change management and how you rolled up it, the visibility of the data gets it cleaner, it, you know, it, it, much quicker. It's like um, crowdsourcing. <laughs> this is wrong. I, you know, because we, you know, in the past, you know, I work hand in hand with our CIO. Uh, they've rolled out different things at the time that were innovative as far as ways of looking. We use Yardi as well, um, and kind of sit on top of that and pull the information out. Um, and, um, you know, people would go into it, oh, it's wrong, right? And then they don't ever use it again, and, and so on. Um, so you've got to be careful about that when you do it. Um, but you're not going to, if you try to get everything clean before you turn it on, uh, that's not going to happen. Um, VTS is a, a good example. We had uh, our property manager <coughs> has the ability to put the encumbrances and options and stuff in there. Um, we kind of use it yeah, kind of, but not really, um, and you know, because nobody was looking at it, nobody was pulling out, all of a sudden now we have visibility, and boy, it's, that got cleaned up really fast, that's wrong, that's not right, um, and so we got the property teams to get those changed and updated, and then you get to see that. Um, one of the things we're looking at, or a couple of things on the, the kind of aggregating the information, we, we have picked to come through Yardi, which uh, we use as our Base accounting system. We actually right now are just started using their Yardi Lion, which is a business intelligence tools that sits on, on top of all their fields, uh, which is easy because it's already in there. Um, what uh, I don't know, it's as robust as uh, Workspace or other ones like that, which I've I'm seeing that I think are pretty cool with um, pulling in from Argit, they pull in from about any place you want them to. Um, and they try to aggregate those together. But what I'm trying to do with the team is, we were doing stuff, well, it's not in Yardi because it was a joint venture partner, and so they pull it out of Yardi, they type it in Excel, and then that's the report that goes out. I'm like, oh, no, no. If you're gonna type it in anywhere, anybody's gonna do manual, put it in the system, so that way anybody can pull it, and we can have visibility to it. So we've kind of changed some behaviors. And you know, for the stuff that well, we don't, we have partners that aren't using our Yardi uh, system to get it in there. We are, you know, if we have to manually do it, we're at least manually do it as a system, so then everything else that feeds off of it, we can get it. But 
we are far, far away from where I want to be. So I don't know that there's any magical answer. And I think that's a good point. I'm sorry, just to transition to the next question. Um, so in terms of data integrity, obviously that's hugely important, but how do you even encourage people to get the data in there? I think that's a big challenge that maybe some of you in this room have faced. Um, so how are you really uh, pushing your teams to adopt new technology and really keep it up to date so that you have it? Well, I guess that's Barry Gosson's hammer. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, well, I think from our standpoint, managing teams, you have you have a lot of visibility on what they're doing, what not getting done. And I think one of the uh, advantages of VTS is you have sort of a user report, so you uh, you understand like who are your big users, who's not doing you know who's not doing anything, who do I need a lighter fire under uh, from the, from that standpoint. Um, I think <clears throat> so. It depends on the technology you're talking about. Obviously, everyone's keeping Yardy up to date and they're reporting up to date. Argus, you know, we're probably all doing quarterly evaluations. Um, you know, internally, not externally. So, um, I mean, that happens as, a, as the nature of business, I think, so. You know, we're fortunate to be in a position of, of you know, having a hammer uh, with a lot of the data inputters, right? And so, uh, the data inputters, is that even a, <laughs> let's, go, let's go with that. Um, those who input data. Um, so, you know, but, uh, you know, like anything, people, uh, you know, you have to inspect what you expect. And so, uh, you know, we spend a lot of time uh, writing, you know, writing things like exception reports that spit out, you know, where data is just flat missing. Uh, and, uh, you know, ultimately, you know, you can drill in and find out, like I say, who's, who's doing it and who's not, and, uh, and, 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 and enforce it, so to speak. The bigger challenge is actually adoption, where you don't have that hammer, right? Like I say, for, frankly, for you know VTS, it's fairly easy with the leasing people. I mean, when I hear people say, "Well, our brokers won't adopt it," uh, you're, I mean, come on, <laughs> I, you can make that happen, and I don't care if the senior guy is doing it or if the 23-year-old analyst is doing it. If it's real time, it's good data. I don't care, and it's in there. So. You can make that happen. What's more difficult is, uh, frankly, is e e internal adoption across your, you know, your own folks uh, to get people to really use the information um, and, and to use it to make better decisions. Yeah, yeah. Um, there are a couple of things that we that, that I've tried to do around that because I feel like not only do we have, um, you know, within the team, it's funny people people's nature. If they're very busy, they use muscle memory, right? So it doesn't matter if they hate the current process. They will still do the current process instead of the new tool that you give them just because it's muscle memory. They don't have to think about it. They don't have to do that. So this is the way we've done it, and it's just kind of second nature to them. So I would look, you have to be realistic. It takes a little time. There's, there is a, you know, I told the team we implemented, and then, you know, okay, everything's on there. We're having activity, all of our brokers on. Now, you know, you go into the adoption, and people are at varying levels of how much, uh, all of our activities in there, but how robust is it, how much people are using it for, hey, we had a broker event, and this was the spike in tours. Or, you know, and these are things that I look at and our sector leaders look at. Um, you know, we've had a bunch of tours and they fall off. Okay, what's with the space? You know, is there something going on with the space that we have a ton of tours going on the market and then the, you know, the B of the, uh, the funnel for conversion um, to any kind of next interest is really steep. Something's going on there, right? So you have to take a look at it. One of the things we've done is by the sector leaders, we're organized by a property sector. Um, and I've put in their goals for this year. You, this is something you have to be on top of. I'm getting usage information from BTS. I'm going to see it, and I'm going to evaluate you based on how your team's doing with it. Um, and so they're looking at this stuff, and part of their job is to help, right? So if they see something like that, they can talk to the asset manager. But let's problem solve. You know, more heads are better than one, and trying to what's going on. Let's talk with your brokers and, and so on and so forth. We've seen adoption more that way because you've got other people who are kind of in it. 
Um, I'm also taking uh, metrics out of it to our board meeting. Um, you know, I have to not only the estimation sheet, but I've got to get our fund managers and stuff to use it and not ask for it manually the way they used to. Um, it's a great communication tool when people aren't sitting next to each other or people are traveling and stuff, but again, people do the same process they've always done. Um, so I start taking those things and those metrics and talking about that stuff at the board meeting, and all of a sudden people are like, oh, okay, well, you know, I'm not, this fund manager's on top of it, but, you know, I'm not, so I now need to. Um, and so a little competition helps. I, so the last big, the billionaire in the white sneakers who was talking to us just before uh, made an excellent point, which is if it's, if it's not easy to use and it doesn't make their job easier, they don't want to do it. Right, so you got to be selective about the technology you pick, um, and and that's how you get buy-in, and that's how you get usage. Great. So I think that kind of leads us to another point um, in terms of those metrics, which uh, Christy you hit on. How are you determining, um, to use Michael's words, what's interesting versus what's actually useful? You obviously have a ton of data, a ton of information. How do you really really distill that down to what's most important? That's me? Sure. Sure. Okay. So, you know, what you're referring to, yeah, there's a lot of data out there and, I, and, and it's easy. We're all sort of inundated. Um, and, you know, in our business, we're sort of data hounds. So, you know, just a ton of it. And, but there's a lot of things that are interesting, as I said, but, but really not useful. So, uh, it, is a, it is a difficult thing. Um, two things uh, that we're focused on. One is uh, benchmarking. So, you know, data in a, in a vacuum. Um, is interesting but not necessarily useful. But data that's benchmarked, whether it's benchmarked against a broader index, whether it's benchmarked against your comp set, whether it's benchmarked against your own portfolio, whether it's benchmarked against you know prior year, whatever it is, put something out there to give it a comparative so that you can use that for some sort of, you know, make some sort of observation, some sort of analysis that allows you to make, again, I'm, I kind of harp on this, but better decisions, data informed decisions. And we rely a lot on experience and, and judgment in this business, which is great, but if you can augment that with good information that helps people make better decisions, then I think you're going to produce better results, better performance. So we're, you know, we're, we're focused highly on, on that. I'm really seeing that at the portfolio management level, because um, they do an incredible job of taking tons of data and doing attribution analyses so they can understand where they're performing well, where they're underperforming, how they, they, these guys are geared towards beating the index, right? That's their job. So, so they need to understand how they slice and dice their portfolio. Are they overweighted here, underweighted here? How has that worked out for them? So that's a valuable tool at that level. Um, great, so talking about, you know, we're talking a lot about what, what you're doing today. Um, what are you looking to in the next five to ten years? I know you've all said in one way or the other that you're at the very beginning of this journey. I think everyone in the room can agree with that. Um, so where do you want to get to in the next five to ten years? I know that's a loaded question. <laughs> I don't even know that I can think that far out. That ten years is a long time. Um, I uh, see Mike in the back of the room. Uh, Mike and I started talking about it um, a year ago, and he was tracking, uh, he's with our, our JLL Research Group, he was tracking various technology companies that were in the space and what they did, like what, what their kind of function was, and sent me a list. It was like three pages long at the time, and I just got the updated one last month, and it's 11 plus pages at this point. Um, of, of things going on, so dynamically things are changing, and even within the groups, you know, I just uh, met with the Costec group again uh, recently, and it's like, you know, everybody's moving along and changing, and their capabilities of what they're doing changing. Uh, BTS, we were talking about it yesterday in the vice report um, that, uh, you know, there's there's different things that they're adding to the tool that a lot of people might not even know because it's you know it's a constant you know update. So five years is even hard to, to project. Um, but what I do know is from us, and you know, um, I work on the private equity side, so we have clients. Um, I have been talking to you know my peers at, at the leadership team that it's you know it's going to be a point where the the clients are no longer okay with getting their flash reports and their quarterly reports and have the information. 
Um, you know, they are under pressure to manage their portfolio, they're mixed in their portfolio, know what's going on real time as well. They're making those decisions. They're going to need that information for us. So, you know, you, we're going to all have to be there, but we're, we can, you know, give them, uh, you know, that kind of, of communication and that kind of data. Um, and they're not waiting for it like I did 10 years ago on the report lag uh, to, to get that information. So we see, you know, that stuff coming there. I also think there's an impact in, in from a team. The younger professionals coming in, um, I have a large team of uh, associates and analysts and I talk with them. Uh, people don't want to be aggregators. You know, people want to analyze, you know, that, that's, you know, they want to spend time, you know, uh, doing stuff that they think is making valuable decisions. It's a, you know, a good job. It's not a great job just to, you know, aggregate a bunch of stuff in Excel to put into one number in somebody's report. Um, and so as leaders, I think we've got to think about that from a talent standpoint of the asset management role and what people want to do as, as asset managers. You know, I, and at my asset managers, they want to know the rest of the portfolio. Like how, you know, what is the OPEX for all of this in San Fran that we've got? And how does that compare and then benchmark it to the outside? They want that information at their fingertips. They go and get it. it they, they're smart. They, they know they need this information to, to make certain decisions, but it takes a lot of manpower, it takes a lot of time, they might not have it when they, when they need it, um, and so they're allocating resources to do that stuff. They're also allocating resources and their time to communicate. So the more things that we can do that puts that, where they're not having to do that, right? They're actually focused on just the asset stuff, the better it gets, and so I anticipate the next three years there'll be some big changes with that. Um, I don't know what five to ten is going to be. I want it to change. Like that. So yeah, it's a, it's a it's a it's a tough question to answer because what's happening is we're all trying. You know, I think you're, probably everybody in the room is trying to, you know, keep up with these changes internally and to keep up with how the business is evolving and changing. Right? Which, you know, we heard some of that this morning, and, and uh, you know, I I would argue that. Disintermediation is a, is, a, is a real possibility out there, and you know, the role of the broker and how transactions are done. Has anybody heard of blockchain technology? If, okay, so like four people raise their hands. Um, if, if you're not at least familiar at some level, uh, go read an article. Uh, there's some excellent articles out there because uh, it can potentially really change how transactions are done. I, I honestly would not advise my children to get into the uh, title insurance business. Um, so, so what block? I mean, blockchain is essentially it's it was developed around Bitcoin, um, and it's and it is technology that allows for secure online transactions. And believe me, I, I think it has real implications for our business. But what that means for Invesco, I don't know. But those are the kinds of things we're thinking about, trying to figure out how do you at least position. You know, for, for changes uh, in, in the industry. So I think right now, as we've been talking about, everyone's trying to find that solution for uh, BI, business intelligence. Ten years from now, it's, it's AI. It's, it's the machines telling us what we should know in real time. Hey, this is going on. You know, uh, back to the billionaire with the sneakers, telling the sales force, like, this is the next step. Hey, alarms going off. You need to be doing this. Um, so I think I think that's the way technology is going. T Ten years is a really long time. I think the iPhone only came out like nine years ago, right? right. So um, it, it, yeah, we're on, we're on a jake curve. I mean, this AI thing. That's that's the. I mean, has, who here uh, has heard of a product called Leverton? So again, about six people. Um, if, again, if, if I, I would not advise my children to become paralegals um, because uh, Leverton is a product that um, will uh, abstract leases in 20 languages, put them into tables, et cetera, and do it uh, for about 50 bucks at least right now and, and much more uh, uh, accurately than, than a paralegal. And uh, it's one of other products. There are other products we're evaluating that, uh, you know, aren't restricted to leases. So, and it's, it's early it's learning as as we go right so christy touched on something that i think is interesting is <clears throat> getting information to the clients i think our investors or that that subset of clients because uh, brandon tells us about 50 other subsets of clients i'm sure but the um 
there's something scary about your investors getting your information at the same time you're getting it. We, we all want to get it, understand it, digest it, make sure there's nothing baked in there that's going to throwing throwing things off. And there's no worse feeling than being on your heels trying to explain something going to, to your client. So we need to get it real time, digest it quickly, process it, hopefully with these tools, and then present sort of a cogent um, explanation of what's going on there and our plan. Okay. And, and some of it's not even just um, data on the occupancy of certain buildings or whatever. Uh, we have clients and, and you know they're asking questions from an operations standpoint. Uh, but they want you know you to have automated policies and access to stuff quick on the fly as you're you're doing things with them and uh, violations of different things and how many government leases and you know do you have any restrictions of this and. You know, so something's come out and they ask that, and, and that's stuff that there's an expectation that, you know, it's not, um, I'll get back to you, and you send 10 analysts to go, you know, figure all of that out and put that information together. They want you to have that at your fingertips and, and have that accessible. So it's, you know, the documents that using the AI and the, uh, you know, to be able to search all your leases, like, shoot, you know, do we have this? exposure somewhere or and I'm not just talking to the tenant but other things that might be in that lease um, and uh, to be able to do it and so you know those things the I kind of see the technology and you know that kind of efficiency bucket which I think a lot of things are around uh, the decision making and helping better decision making and then the predictive which is really cool and will be really sexy to get there I kind of feel like we need to figure the first two out a little bit more uh, but you know, even stuff we were talking about with BTS and projecting whether you can uh, a tenant's going to renew based on all the data they saw. I was like, oh, that would be so fun. Um, and, and I mean, that's not that far off, but that's exciting. And uh, but to have that, so instead of well, you know, I think it's 65. The broker thinks maybe a little higher. You know, you're kind of anecdotally making that gut based on conversations. But they got a lot of metrics now that they're taking a look at and going, well, you know. With the standard deviation of this, it's they're they're probably about ninety percent going to renew. So I want you know I want to know that kind of information, um, and so we'll get there. We still know that we're there quite yet. Great. And so Michael, you talked about a lot of different tools and platforms that your teams are looking at and using. Um, how do you really evaluate what's going to be the right thing for your teams? I think with a lot of people in this room, you're, you're aware of a lot of technology, but is it the right time to roll it out? How do you sell that internally? Um, so I'd love for you to kind of Yeah, and that's becoming increasingly more difficult, yeah. right? And, and just literally in the last two, three years. It wasn't that hard when, I mean, honestly, I, I had VTS and high tower to choose from, and you know, we did a bake off and we made a choice and, and we implemented and we're happy and, you know, life is good, but we've got all these, however many platform, 11 pages of, yeah. <laughs> you know, coming at us every day. So we've actually, uh, are actually moving to a more formal process, honestly, which I hate at some level, but on the other, you know, we've got to have a filtering system so that we have a, uh, both regionally and globally, because we do have a global platform, uh, because we only have so many, you know, look, look, it takes resources to do all this and that's the other thing um, and you can't just hand it off to your IT team it also takes business resources right if you're not working collaboratively with your IT team you know it's it's never gonna happen so um, so you have to manage your resources just like anything else uh, so we've developed a you know a, a essentially a committee and uh, we're you know these these sorts of uh, whether it's a, a new software platform or app or whether it's a need internally that we think we have to build that sort of, you know, funnels up through this regional team of very, pretty senior people who understand various aspects of the business and we prioritize based on business priorities and, you know, focus on those that we think are going to have, uh, you know, a meaningful impact either to, A, number one, our, 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 our maniacal focus on uh, investment performance or B, on productivity. <clears throat> well, it's, it's really sexy to be out there and kind of grabbing the new technologies and being first adopters, but we take the opposite approach. <laughs> we're, we're very selective. It's got to be proven. It's got to be, you know, it has to be adapted by a number of companies and working successfully. And it has, it has the features we want, and it works, and it has the open architecture. 
And then we start beta testing. <laughs> so we were probably the last investor um, in the United States to go to BTS, which is well long enough this year. So, but well, you um, went three times. So. <laughs> but yes, I'm the three times. You're the only person in the room that can say it. <laughs> Maybe. Uh, raise your hand. Uh, here we are. If you can. Uh, yes. As a follow up to this question, and it's kind of a counterpoint like to Apple. They have a lot of fail fast, right? They have a solution, it doesn't work, they drop it, and one of the next one kind of figure out fast. Have you guys, or have you, or can you speak to um, either system, process, or solution in general, where you adopted it, didn't work out, you dropped it, how do you get that decision quickly to say, hey, you want this network now? Let's find the new one. I think it's when you pilot it, right? A lot of the, so a lot of the new stuff that we've been looking at, we, um, uh, if we, you know, people are very interested, we think this would be really helpful, we figure out a way to, whether it's a building or, or a market or something that we're going to uh, subset, we're going to pilot a little bit and see, does it really help, do they really like it, uh, were they interested in it, and so on, and, you know, part of my change management is getting a lot of people who need to use it um, on the team to kind of figure out you know, the pilot or to figure out uh, how we implement and so on because then they're, you know, bought into it. Um, but, you know, I, we, I haven't yet, in my experience, at, at LaSalle had to, um, you know, something failed and then you kind of bail on it. But um, you, you do have to balance, you know, based on what Michael said from a resources standpoint, love to do a bunch of things, but look, you've got to be realistic. You know, and running an asset management team, the most important thing is that they're driving value at the assets for our clients, that's first, right? Now, having these things will help that and make that better, uh, but I can't have them stop doing that job, right, so that we can impl implement those and it impacts them even if I have other people actually working on the project itself. Um, and people by nature can only handle so much change. Um, I think, you know, I made some, we changed our asset management structure uh, last year and you know, I made some decisions of certain things I held off on that we were going to do that I would love to have already. Um, but I thought, you know, that's just dangerous, right? You, you've got to, you, you got to think about that and what the team can handle um, in making changes. And so I think, um, even though that's great for Apple, and I do think you can't have everything buttoned up and perfect to go forward in a solution, um, you have to think about. Um, what the impact to your team and your organization is by doing that too much. Yeah, I, I would sort of reiterate, reiterate what uh, Christy said. We, we, I can't think of an example where we've had something just fail and we've just scrapped it. I mean, we probably, you know, you know, fall towards being uh, slow to adopt. I mean, I, I want to be leading edge, but I don't want to be leading edge on everything, right? I want to. Have something you know it took us uh, a year to in the bake off between uh, BTS and Hightower um, so it, you know it's it's we're, we're very careful to adopt because we can't afford the resources to try just everything that's out there and then see if it works I mean there are at an asset level there's my notes I can't talk about it. <laughs> at an asset level uh, you know that can work because you can try it you know you can try it here and there and hey and, and I'd say honest buildings is a good example of that it's worked on a few assets so hey you know, and, and that's not a tough implementation. So, that, you know, that we may be able to more broadly uh, implement. Uh, at an enterprise level, they, they think it's really tough. I uh, just want to go back to Michael's comment about um, multiple different software solutions. You're aggregating that information into a data warehouse. Can you talk a little bit about the interface of getting the data out of the data warehouse? Are you using something third party? something that you guys have created. Um, you talk about what happens when it is stored in a data warehouse. What do you do with it afterwards, and what's that interface look like? No. You want to <laughs> I, can't, I can't talk about it. Because I'm not, I'm not, I'm not you know, I'm a, I'm a geek, but I'm not a, I'm, I'm not a uh, uh, IT guy. So, you know, the actual interface. Our, you know, our, our front end, frankly, on our data warehouse is not as user friendly as, as it needs to be. And I think, again, we started developing this four years ago, and um, you know, we're we're looking at some 
you know, potential material changes now to take it to, to the level where it's a little easier to interface. But but that is a you know that is part of the hard part. And it's also you learn and you know these these software guys are really good. You know they and, and this fail quick. You know they understand this is it's iterative. You know and unfortunately anything you build internally you know we we just it's it's very difficult to have the kind of iteration and fail quickly and keep it that the true software developers do so. I don't know if I'm answering your question other than I don't have great answers. <laughs> That's fine. Uh, may I ask one more? I uh, just had a question about the timing, right? How long it takes our industry to adapt to new technology. Are, are you seeing any competitors right now who are figuring this out and are creating a disruptive force uh, that is, is giving you concern? Are, are there people that have said, you know what, it's not going to take us a year or two to adopt <laughs> one piece of software? and we have a different model. Um, are, are you seeing any companies out there that you're looking to that, that uh, concern you uh, because they have a, a tech-enabled platform that, that, that might be able to uh, uh, grow at a much faster pace? Hey, I'll, I'll jump in. Directly, directly in our space, which is you know, in money manager and investment manager, I, I haven't seen it. I, I, and when I talk to our peers, it seems like we're all sort of Again, a little bit like the C-suite panel, you know, with the operators today. We're in one phase or another, but we're in, we're, we're in a similar band uh, in terms of technology and adoption, how to how to apply it in our business. Um, but there may be somebody out there. I mean, you know, what if I'm, you know, any of us? What keeps me up awake awake at night? You know, and me not as much as you younger guys, because I can be out of here in five years. Of you know, but, uh, <laughs> but is the uh, you know it, it's the guys you don't it's the it's the ones you haven't heard of it's the it's the you know the the Uber or the real disruptor you know in our business which hasn't really arisen yet I don't think at an operator in a brokerage standpoint I don't think it certainly an investment management standpoint in real estate um, but all I have to do is look you know at our mothership and and look at what uh, you know what. You know the the changes that are occurring there. You know we're again we're a global money manager. You know real estate's a part of that, but we're man, we're managing you know uh, you know equities and you know every every other asset class around the globe. And there's disruption happening there today, and uh, I can see it for real estate. Well, I would I would characterize that our three organizations manage institutional capital that wants an allocation into real estate. They, they've been selecting their managers the same way forever, through the same process, um, and I haven't seen any technology arise that helps them make their decisions faster or point them in a different direction, um, because these organizations have track records, uh, they have, you know, we're making investments in technology, we're making investments in people, building teams and capabilities and we have a long-standing track record that they don't want to make a bet with the newcomer and maybe they'll do it with a um what are those new uh new you know the new fund managers that have only been in business for five years they'll throw them you know a bone five ten million five dollars or something like that but real meaningful capital i don't think is going to shift away i think i've seen more of certain people that uh, or you see as a uh, talk to various uh, companies, tech companies, and, and so on, um, whether it be at the, pro we haven't even talked about stuff at the property level, right, versus just at our business level. Um, you see some of the same names come up. And what I love about the asset management space is that people are very collegial and um, everybody's kind of in that same boat and trying to figure it out and this wave that's coming through and you know so you know I reach out and talk to people or ask people and I think people are very um, I'm like gosh I've seen that name a bunch of times I, I want to get together with you and talk about how are you looking at this what are you seeing um, and people are sharing you know sharing that um, we also call around you know when you're looking at a tool you know one of the things I ask is you know who else who, you know who are your clients and I want a reference because I want to I call and talk to them how did you implement it how is it working what and some of it is not just the evaluation of the tool but also you know what were kind of trials and tribulations and resistance or 
whatever that was going on there. So you do see some people's names show up as, as pretty front runner innovators that you can call on. Um, and then, you know, across the board, it seems like, well, this group is a little bit more ahead on this, and this group has a quant team that does this for their buy cells, and then, you know, so on and so forth. But nobody's, I haven't seen anybody that, like, fully has that picture. Um, but they all have something that they're kind of heading on. Um, from the question that you asked a, a moment ago about the kind of, seems everybody I talked to kind of has that same problem. How are they aggregating the data? And they first got to have the warehouse, and then what report writer they put on, whether it's Tableau or the Power BI or whatever it is. Um, and then there's softwares that are trying to, like I mentioned, workspace that are trying to aggregate that for you and be your data management warehouse. So um, it has a pretty good environment. If you haven't seen their stuff, um, there seems to be a similar that a lot of people are using that kind of, or creating their own top of it. Because I ask that question all the time. Because we're looking for what we should be doing. Great, so we have about five to ten minutes left. So I just want to take any final questions uh, from the audience. We probably have time for about two more questions. I, I have a question for the I mean what have you guys you know Michael was sharing some of the different things that they've seen solutions of uh, whether it's AI solutions or you know something in capital, you know, managing capital spend. Um, anybody want to volunteer information today? What, what we use to aggregate? Is it a, you know just new technologies or new things that you're looking at? We, we use a lot of the same technologies. You know, the interface. We use a SQL server. I think the biggest thing for us has been SQL because with that is we use the queries where we can code to Yardi and Argus and get that data. We could always run metrics as to what, it, what, it, what a new lease for capital does to that property. You have to pick a, you have to decide on a platform where you're going to have your time with it because with so many different platforms and duplication of data, the process really becomes Yardi, right? Like us, that's the point of entry for overwhelmingly amount of uh, Data that we then populate. We have you know, multi family with residential and residential development with all this retail. More than sure we have one of the um, And you look at it completely differently than all the different uh, food groups. So it becomes really hard to have one thing that goes to our executive board that uh, you can really benchmark the metrics of the company, right? both here and in Japan and in, in the UK. So that's why I was really interested when you were throwing those off. I thought we were way behind. <laughs> <laughs> I started getting nervous. <laughs> we got a question back here, too. Okay. Go for it. Uh, just a question on uh, as, as data has evolved for you guys, um, has your data governance policies, how, how have they evolved? Have you had to resource that up? And, and what's the sort of um, you know prediction as to where that's going to head as you build out warehouses and all the rest of it? <laughs> it's you know it, it, it's an ongoing challenge and, and uh, you know we but I mean we have resources you know we have resources in Hyderabad uh, India that help scrub our data you know we write exception reports but somebody mentioned it you know maybe it was Christy you, you can't wait till everything's perfectly clean to get it out there and I think that's something we're actually learning is the feedback you get once it's out there is your best um, data integrity tool. And we're frankly trying to. I'm trying. I'm trying to get the, you know, the technology IT group to, to put a feedback button on our internal so that so so somebody can immediately when they spot a data uh, deficiency can flag it. We're not, it's not there right now. You still have to send an email, which people don't take the time to do. So, but I think that's where ultimately it's going to come from because there's so much data. Uh, you know, you could have a team of 100 people scrubbing it, and you're still going to have problems. And you have different definitions. I'm sure if we asked everybody in the room, they'd have a slightly different definition about any real estate metric that we're talking about. So with the, you know, our data governance, we're really actually part of this committee right, is, is setting some more standards with that, which unfortunately you have to do. Um, but we're trying to you know, have common attributes, definitions, and, and things like that. Uh, 
and you know how and when certain things are scrubbed or looked at and, and so on. Cybersecurity comes into there that to play. So much of our stuff is uh, now you know we are collecting that data, um, and so just being comfortable with with a lot of that as well. Um, so that's kind of the the committee that I mentioned before. That's part of um, you know not only the you know prioritizing what tools or thinking about what's our tech strategy, uh, our business side tech strategy, but also what's our governance, what's our what's our risk, those things that we need to talk about. I think you have data that you control because you create it. You know, that's Yardi, Argus. These are very powerful um, programs that are very <clears throat> important to what we do. And then you have market data um, and you know, you can either try to scrub it and get it perfect, or you can take various sources of market data and overlay it and get a order of magnitude view about, you know, the direction of the market, you know, what's happening. Um, because all of those data sources have, you know, inaccuracies in them. I mean, if, you, if anyone's ever sat down with TPR Postar or, um, uh, what's the other one drives me crazy, and you ask them specific questions about specific buildings, they're gonna get it wrong. They always have it wrong. But they have the trends right, <laughs> typically. And if, if you're using that information to impact your judgment um, without saying, well, here's the data point I'm relying on, then there's value to that. Great, we have time for one last question.